Hello, and welcome to another episode of 20th Century Adventures with Nathan Logsdon. Today, we're doing a early 20th century squirrel hunt. So we're going to talk about things, we're going to get into some stuff, but right now, the light's fading, we've got to get camp set up before it gets dark, and hopefully get a chance to go out and do a little squirrel scouting before the sun's down. Okay, camp is up. Now we'll put in the, the last few homey touches. This being an overnighter only, and with the intention being squirrel hunt, we didn't really go overboard on the gear. Uh, this is minimalist camping at its best. So pay attention, you can survive with very little. I didn't bring a lot out here with me, but I intend to have a good time. Now the first thing we wanna do, because this is fall, this works out really well, First thing we want to do is we want to make a good soft bed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to gather up some of these leaves and I'm going to put them inside my tent, get a nice soft cushion on the ground. Now the bed roll is really simple. Here's the bedroll. Now here's the thing about October. Right now it's really hot. I gotta come off these layers. But tonight it's gonna get pretty cold. So when you're doing a fall camp, make sure you've got enough clothing to dress in layers uh, that you can peel off outer layers as you go. I do have a heavier coat for later on tonight because it might dip below freezing. Um, my bedroll, I really put some thought into that. That's important because the only time you're gonna be miserable in October is gonna be when you're sleeping and you don't want that. So what I've got here is I've got a quilt, I've got a lap robe from a car. Uh, this one in particular is bear hide. That's really gonna be the ticket to keeping me warm, but it's not the full length of my body. It's only gonna cover from the chest down, but that's okay. 
Uh, and then I've got a real nice thick heavy wool blanket. This should be plenty to get me through the night. Um, these, the, the old quilt and the blanket are stuff that you can find very easily. Uh, finding something like this lap robe uh, or a buffalo robe, something like that, would have been um, less common to have a buffalo robe in the, in the 1920s uh, because by then the buffalo were on their way to almost extinction. Um, but the, uh, the lap robes were still a thing. Uh, they date back to the carriage days, horse and carriage days. Um, the uh, finer automobiles would always have a lap robe and uh, used lap robes could be found uh, at secondhand stores in the 20s and a lot of guys would go there and get a slightly worn out lap robe that didn't look pretty enough to be in a Packard anymore uh, but it still had the leather in it uh, which is what's going to be the key to keeping you warm. That leather will reflect your body heat back to you. So now I've used a piece of old horse harness here for my bedroll strap and it works real nicely except that it's really stiff. It takes a little work to get into it but it sure holds together nice. Here's that lap robe I was talking about. You can see this is a big old piece of bear hide that's been sewn to a backing. Uh, this is some sort of fuzzy backing and then it's got a wool felt binding around the outside. Kind of pretty. These were worn over the lap by ladies in the back seat to keep them from getting cold while driving. Cars didn't have heaters at this time. So we're going to actually put this on top and we'll put it hair side towards your body. Uh, that's just a lot more comfy. Now I'll actually have this back. And what I'll do is I'll lay my quilt down. And it's also folded in half, but we'll lay it the other way. So when I get in, I'll be inside the quilt with the edge, the wrapped edge out here, the open edge over here, then I'll pull that wool blanket over me, and then I'll have the wrapped edge over there, open edge over here. That'll make me a lot more comfortable um, because I won't have a gap between the blankets where air can get into me. this over. This is not only insulation, but it also helps keep that air from getting in around you. Now, I didn't bring a pillow because I have two coats. Now, Chances are I'll be wearing this before I get in bed, but I won't want to sleep in it. So I'll take the coat off and I'll roll it up and that'll be my pillow. And there we have it. There's camp. Let's see what we've got here. So this is the bed. You saw how that was made up. My coat for a pillow. I've got a couple of guns with me, probably more than I need, but I wanted to show you guys a couple of different options when it comes to hunting squirrels. Um, normally I would just go out with whichever gun I chose to use. Now, let's see. We've got all of our provisions, some entertainment, in the form of a book, of course. I've got a water container there. Um, Back in the 20s, a lot of people would camp alongside of creeks and streams, um, and they would drink that water. Um, even then, even in the wilderness, that water wasn't really that safe for you. Um, 
and nowadays it's really not. Uh, so I brought water from home, but I have a period container to keep it in. Um, I've got a little bag with some uh, odds and ends, uh, toiletries and things that I might need. Um, and then I've got my binoculars, field glasses they call them. Um, we'll get into that when we go hunting. And then um, cookware, I've got my canteen and my trusty quick light lantern. And, uh, and then my piece of oil cloth canvas that I've stretched from the framework for the top down like so. All right, let's talk a little bit about some of the things that uh, we're gonna use here. Um, we're gonna talk about these rifles and uh, a shotgun first. Um, so this is my go-to when it comes to period squirrel hunting. This is a uh, Stevens 22 long rifle, bolt action. Uh, they called these hardware store guns. Uh, you could go down to the hardware store and pick one of these up on the tool rack for about three dollars and uh, They were just great little guns. Uh, this one is Probably a hundred years old still attack driver um, They don't have serial numbers on them uh, Because they were just tools. They didn't even think of them as guns um, So these were made in the millions and they're all over the place uh, You can pick them up online uh, for under a hundred dollars uh, great little guns, perfect for uh, for squirrel hunting. It's got a bolt action, tube feed, nice little gun. Sometimes they they stick. This one sticks going in. Of course, this one you know they started making these in 1917, so I'm not sure how old this one is, but it's pretty old. Uh, definitely at least 100 years old. Um, this is my favorite. Um, now this is not exactly a period gun. Uh, this is a Henry lever action 22. Um, this is a great little gun, um, but this wasn't actually made in the period. This is a modern gun. Uh, however, it is very similar uh, to the Marlin 1891 model. Uh, and if you're lucky enough to have one of those, by all means, that is the thing to use. Um, However, this, uh, this gun runs about $400, and it's kind of a, uh, a cheaper version of that, uh, based on the same idea. So you could probably, at a distance, pass this off um, as an 1891 22 long rifle, but it's clearly not. So uh, still a lot of fun. Tube feed, 22 long rifle, uh, nice crisp action. Uh, this is a great gun to squirrel hunt with. It's lightweight. It's a lot of fun. And then this is for those of us who can't see well enough to shoot with a 22 anymore. This is a 16 gauge shotgun made by Ithaca. Uh, this particular model is, uh, I think based on the serial number, this one's like 1939. Um, but these were made as early as the 20s. Uh, so and they were made up into the 50s. Um, so these are pretty easy to come by. Uh, a couple hundred bucks, buy one used, uh, and you're ready to go. Um, look for one that has a good clean bore, not a lot of pitting. Um, and, uh, and these don't kick real bad for a shotgun. It's only a 16 gauge. Uh, use some number six shot, number seven, something like that. It's just fine for squirrels. The drawback to hunting squirrels with a shotgun is all the shot gets in the meat. And that's why if you can do it, 22 long rifle, headshot, that's the way to go. Uh, because then you'll have a good, clean piece of meat. Um, but if you aren't skilled enough to use the 22, the shotgun will get the job done. Just be very careful when you're chewing. I've cracked a tooth on buckshot before. You don't want to do that. All right. Well, it's time to pick a gun and get out in the woods. I think I'm going to go with my trusty little Stevens bolt action today. All right, here we are out in the woods. I'm trying to keep my voice down. Hope you guys can hear me. Um, I've picked a spot where I can sit. I got a good view of all the trees around me. And right here, there's nut holes. It's a leaf. This is evidence that a squirrel's been cutting on some nuts here nearby. So that's what we're looking for. Now, 
there's all kinds of videos and supplies online you can see uh, to tell you how to squirrel hunt. And lots of products you can buy. This is what I use. It's pretty much foolproof and all it costs you is 50 cents. Um, you take two quarters and you put one in your hand like that. And then you kind of cup your fingers around it tight as you can. What you're doing is you're making a drum head. So you make a drum head with that quarter, hand open on the bottom, take the other quarter, I don't know how well that sounds coming through on the camera, but it's echoing in this woods. It sounds just like a squirrel opening a nut. And the other thing these quarters are good for is they've got little ridges on the sides. You can take that, you can make the sound of the teeth gnawing on a, on a nut hull. So that's my 50 cent squirrel call. <clears throat> now I'd better stop explaining things and get down to being quiet if I want to see any squirrels. Hello folks, welcome back. So I went out, did a little squirrel hunting, traveled into the woods a bit, and um, saw a lot of squirrels. Uh, didn't really see any that I felt confident taking a shot on. It's one thing about hunting for me is if I can't make a clean kill, I don't even make an attempt. Um, I find that's very important. I want it to be uh, as responsible as possible. So. Um, but there were plenty of them running around. I could hear all kinds of activity in the woods. Um, and uh, as I was walking back to camp, I actually uh, jumped a very nice uh, large doe uh, that was maybe 30 yards from the car. Um, so that was a real neat experience. And um, I tried to get it on camera, but I, I was not fast enough. But um, what I can say is that my buffalo check 
uh, was making fine camouflage because I saw all kinds of animals and they uh, didn't notice me until I moved. So, uh, feel like that worked out pretty well. Um, hopefully, uh, I might get a chance for uh, a squirrel tomorrow. Um, it got dark fast, uh, as it does later in the year. Um, and so uh, I made it back to camp uh, just at dark. Well, good morning, everyone. I slept all right. Uh, didn't get quite as cold as I was expecting. Got down to about 36 degrees, uh, so not quite freezing. Um, I didn't get cold. Uh, I did find the ground a little hard. Uh, probably should have put a few more leaves down. Um, <clears throat> but uh, also, I'm not as young as I used to be. So, definitely feeling that this morning. Um, some of the ways that I kept warm, uh, one of the key factors for staying warm uh, when you're camping in cool weather is uh, put on fresh socks before you go to bed. Um, so I did that, and that made a big difference. Kept my feet warm all night. Um, your socks, even if they feel dry, if you've worn them all day, they'll be a little bit damp just from sweat from your feet. And they also uh, get dirt uh, from skin particles and from the insides of your boots, and that gets compacted into the sock. Um, and all of that conducts cold. So if you put on dry, fresh, clean socks before you go to bed, um, your feet will stay warmer and you're ready for the next day. Um, also, fingerless gloves, uh, they are just absolutely wonderful. These are wool um, and use them in the woods or anytime that it's cold. Um, they allow your fingers to have some dexterity um, and you can sleep in them, no big deal. Uh, keep your hands, hands nice and warm. They're really good for hunting because you can still use your trigger finger. Uh, so the other thing is keeping your head covered while you're sleeping. That's just going to be the key to everything. Uh, if your head's cold, you lose 70% of your heat through your head, to the top of your head. So if you can keep your head warm while you're sleeping, your body's going to stay warm. Now I sometimes will use a knitted stocking cap. Um, I couldn't find that when I was packing my stuff to go out today uh, or yesterday. Uh, so actually what I did was I took the cap that I'm wearing it's got plenty of room in it. I pulled it down to cover my ears. And I know this is going to look silly, but staying warm is more important than looking silly. So, uh, this is how I slept, and I slept very well. Now, <clears throat> sun's just coming up, and I can hear all kinds of activity in the woods all around me. Uh, it sounds like there's an army marching through the woods, so I'm going to get out and see if I can shoot a squirrel. Well, I'm back from hunting. Once again, no squirrels. Um, I did actually take a couple of shots. It uh, turns out that my 16 gauge shotgun is hitting low, so clean misses. Um, didn't have to worry about injuring anything and not being able to kill it. Um, but unfortunately, nothing to show for the day's hunt. And that's just how it goes sometimes, to be honest. Uh, for me, a lot of it is just getting out in the woods and enjoying nature and being uh, in the trees and hearing all the little sounds around me. And, uh, you know, that's, that's really the main reason I go out. And uh, so it's not really that big of a disappointment if I don't kill anything. Uh, and of course, there's nothing to clean or take care of afterwards. So, um, anyway, I'm going to make some breakfast. I got my little uh, gasoline stove working here. Uh, it took a little time, but I uh, finally got it warmed up and it's going, so uh, we're going to start off and make some coffee.
Now, as with any good cowboy coffee, you don't really measure this out and you don't uh, filter the grounds in any way. Um, you just kind of put a couple of handfuls in there. That's uh, probably more than enough. <clears throat> Throw some water on top of it. Leave a little space to add some cold water on top uh, once it's boiled. Uh, adding a little cold water on top will help the grounds settle to the bottom and makes it easier to keep the grounds out of your cup and therefore out of your mouth. All right, we'll put that on there and let that start heating up. And then uh, we'll get our bacon ready. Now I didn't uh, soak this like I meant to, uh, so it's going to be real salty. Uh, probably won't eat too much of it, but mainly what I wanted it for was to have uh, some grease to fry my eggs. And I didn't bring any seasoning for the eggs, I didn't bring any salt. Um, so the salt that's in the, the bacon grease will season the eggs as well. Now, of course, I'm making bacon and eggs for breakfast, um, but in the teens and 20s, bacon and eggs was just a meal, and it was just as commonly eaten for lunch or dinner as it was uh, for breakfast. This knife is sharper than it looks. This stuff's just really thick. It's kind of a dry cure sort of thing, and it's uh, it's pretty hard to cut through. Here we are. So the way this worked out, I fried the salt, uh, the country bacon first, and uh, then fried the eggs and the grease from it, and it worked out really nice. Used the knife as a spatula. Took some finesse, but it worked. And uh, now I'm gonna sit down and eat some eggs and bacon and uh, some fresh hot coffee. And it's starting to rain. It hasn't rained in weeks. If you want rain, just go camping. Let's see how this works. Hey, that's pretty good. There's just enough salt in the eggs from the salt in the bacon. The eggs are very tasty. Well, folks, it's that time again. Time to break camp and go home. It's always the worst part of every camp. But I've had some wonderful experiences this weekend. Some of them I couldn't even get on film. Some of my favorite highlights were spooking a deer as I walked back to my car last night, um, hearing the coyotes off on the distance, 
uh, in the middle of the night last night, a great big owl perched in the tree right above my camping spot and woke me up with his screeching and hooting. Uh, those experiences you just can't put down into words and you can't put them on film. You just have to live them in the moment. And no, I didn't get any squirrels on my squirrel hunt. Not for lack of trying. But I really don't care about that because that's not what I was out here for. I was out here for the experience, to spend time in the woods, to enjoy myself, have some quiet time, and that's what it's all about. I may be going home empty-handed, but I'm going home with a full heart. Look forward to seeing you again next time. We'll continue doing these videos, and I hope you'll continue to like and subscribe to the YouTube channel, 20th Century Adventures. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time. Women always flirt with Pat and pin him on the seat. He makes a bigger hit with them than any living tree. Says he, I meet a million girls, but I just pass it by. I never even tip me hat, and here's the reason why. I love my owl tomato, my owl tomato, cause nobody else can love me like my owl tomato can. Her corn beef and cabbage is way above the average, and I'm proud to be her man. You can have your Sammy's and your Mary Jane, but none of them compare with my old ball and chain. I love my old tomato, my old tomato, cause nobody else can love me like my old tomato can. I get Mac notes every day, the secret line tell you. From showgirls in the music box, and in the folly, too. Do they all wise to talk to me, but I just pass it by. I never give the comfort, and here's the reason why. I love my ultimate, my ultimate, cause nobody else can love me like my ultimate can.